let's get into our topic today. Last week, I want to give you a little recap of last week because uh, we started a, a two-part series called uh, Re-Revitalize. And uh, it is just a reminder of where we're at in culture today, where we're at in the church world today, where we're at just as what we're facing in a uh, post-COVID world. And I, I shared um, I shared just such a, 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 a visual representation of how crisis changes us. And it was a Eugene Kabotov, uh, we, we threw his picture up here. This is the difference between uh, 1941 and 1945. Four years on the, um, three years in a, a, um, a POW camp, but a year just uh, fighting World War II. And it's amazing how much crisis can change us. How much crisis can change us. And the reality is in the world that we're living in, we are living in a post-pandemic crisis world. And the fact is that COVID has changed how many, how so many people, how so many people respond to each other, how they respond to uh, their workplace, how they respond to others online, how they respond to church. COVID has changed so much because we are in a, we were in crisis mode, weren't we? During COVID, we were, we were all, every, everyone was like, we're just all tense. We just don't know what to do. And now people are relaxing a little bit, but our thinking has been changed. And last week we shared about Exodus. We, we talked about the Exodus of Israel. And, and I, I, use, I was using Israel as an example. I'm just giving you a recap in case you weren't here last week. Give you an example of, of what a world and a culture looks like after a long-term crisis. Now, we, we've had, we had two years of COVID, but it shut everything down so completely and so fully that uh, it has shifted the way we think, the way we process, the way we look. And it's the exact same thing that happened to the people of Israel. Israel, now theirs was much more extensive. They spent 400 years in slavery. 400 years in slavery. slavery. And then after the 10 plagues, you were familiar, if you're not familiar with the 10 plagues, just watch the Prince of Egypt. It'll bring you up to speed on that. Uh, but the, after the 10 plagues and Moses standing before Pharaoh, let my people go. And they finally released the people of Israel. They finally released the people of Israel and 600,000 people. They go on a journey into the desert. And the funny thing in this was those 600,000 people were the chosen God of people, the chosen people of God, the chosen people of God. But they had forgotten how to be the people of God, which is what brought us to Exodus chapter 20. When Exodus chapter 20, they walked through the Ten Commandments, and we're not going to walk through what those particular commandments are, but God gave on that time when Moses was on Mount Sinai. It's 13 chapters of Exodus. It's chapter 20 through 33. He didn't just get the Ten Commandments. He got commandments on how to live holy for God, what the tabernacle was to look like, what worship was to look like. He, he went through this big, you know, God went through 40 days 40 days of teaching Moses what it looked like to live a holy life set apart for God. But while he was up there, what did the people of Israel do? The people of Israel, they built themselves a golden calf. Why? Because they needed something to worship. They needed something to worship, even though God had delivered them. God had shown them miracles. God had given them sign after sign after sign. Forty days is all it took for them to say, well, I guess Moses ain't coming back. We better do something about it. And I really love what Aaron said in Exodus chapter 32, verse 22. You don't have to turn there. He said, don't be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. You know, one of the themes in the book of Judges, uh, Judges is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. Uh, it's the theme in there is, again, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's, and every time he does, what he do, what's he do? He raises up a judge to deliver them. The other, the other favorite phrase from the Old Testament that God uses to describe Israel, he calls them a stiff-necked people. Kind of goes along with the back pain of the day. Um, but stiff-necked people, they, they don't want to see. 
They don't want to follow. They don't want to lead. It's like a donkey. They want to do what they want to do. And these are the people that God had called to be his chosen people. Well, here's why it was so much challenging. It's so challenging. Because after a crisis, they needed new structures and paradigms of how to live a holy life. Israelites, 400 years in captivity, they would forgotten how to be the people of God, and they had gone through a major crisis. And when if, within the first three months of leaving Egyptian captivity, God laid out the guides, said, this is what it looks like to be the chosen people. This is what it looks like to live a holy life. Why? Because people needed the reminders. They needed to be told. And I'll be honest with you, I think in a lot of ways, even though it's obviously a, a much lesser extent of 400 years of captivity, the last two years, so many Christians have forgotten what it looks like to be part of a local church. They forget what it looks like to be part of a giving body. And we have, we, our brains have been shaped and changed by what happened. Uh, I shared with you that there's actually a new uh, neurological disorder that they have described as post COVID stress disorder. That people live for so long in that season in tension and in stress that all of their perceptions, their response to difficulty has changed. It's through a new evaluation. It's through a new, um, it's through a new lens. Before COVID, during the allergy season, if somebody sneezed, you thought nothing of it. Now, during post-COVID, if somebody sneezes, you're pretty sure they should be wearing a mask and at home by themselves. Right? Right? It's how much COVID has changed us in such a brief period of time. In such a brief period of time. You know, the people of Israel were, and continue to believe, I believe God still believes for the deliverance of the Jewish people, that they would turn to him and accept Jesus as the Messiah. But before they were taken to Egypt, God made them a promise. You know, God made them a promise. The promise that God made was actually in Genesis chapter 15, and I just closed my sermon. Makes it harder to preach it. In Genesis 15, God promised the people of Israel that he had a land for them. That after 400 years, here it says, Genesis 15, verse 12, it says, As the sun was setting, Abraham fell, fell asleep, uh, fell deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over, come, came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they served as slaves. And afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. This is the land that Abraham had. Will come back here for the sins of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Have you ever had somebody make a promise to you and then not keep it? I think that's one of the things that is so painful for those that walk through divorce. There was a promise made. Sometimes people say divorce is, or marriage is 50-50. Marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is 100%, 100%, everybody in it. And if you're the one making 100% and the other person is not willing, the betrayal that is felt in that moment is devastating. Absolutely devastating. Bennett is very careful about saying what he promises to do because he knows I will remind him. You promised you would do it. He said, I didn't say I'd promise because he doesn't want a broken promise. He doesn't want a broken promise. Think about the world that we lived in the last two years with COVID. Now, I'm not trying this again. This is not a political statement. This is not a message about any of that. But think about how much distrust rose up during COVID. State officials disagreed with federal officials. Local officials disagreed with state officials. On and on it went. So much so that we had local bureaucrats, unelected individuals making decisions that affected the entire city or county. 
And some seemed to enjoy the power so much that they defied governors, defied presidents, defied anyone that wasn't themselves. And what did it do in the long run? Do you know what I think it did? I think it eroded trust in leadership at every level. We started hearing phrases like, well, that's your truth. Well, you know, all truth is God's truth, right? We started hearing, you know, we, the, the shout of fake news was, was regular, but we, we started hearing things that it, that's what you believe, but that's not what I believe. And it seemed to rise in such a manner that all of a sudden words were redefined. Words were redefined. The, the conversation about gender identity, how confused that has become when people are in the place where they claim they have no gender or they have multiple genders or they, what, I'm, I'm not entirely certain all of the words that go along with it. But what happened in the COVID world that we lived in is that many, many people felt promises were broken. This is how many of you were shocked at the response, federal, state, local, where you say, we're, we're supposed to be the greatest country in the world. And we're not even looking like we can tie our own shoes right now. How many of you felt that that was a break in the promise of what the American dream was? Now, this isn't a message about America, but it is amazing how quickly everything eroded. Now, I want to pause at this moment because I don't want to dishonor the memory of those that have served in the military and those that have lost their lives on Memorial Day. Uh, we recognize that this is not just the season for barbecues and beach time. This is the moment that we want to recognize those that they have given all that they have for this country. Memorial Day is an important time. And I want you to understand in this message and conversation, as we talk about America, as we talk about COVID, as we talk about these things, this is not a political conversation. This is not to disparage our country. I love, I love our country. I, it is a privilege that we have to be an American. I want to recognize those that lost a loved one. That's what Memorial Day is. Those that have lost a life. We have Veterans Day. That's a different holiday. That's when we recognize all veterans. Memorial Day is specifically about those that gave all. And so as our conversation goes today, I still honor America. I thank God that I was born here. I thank God for the privilege of being a citizen here. But I also recognize that heaven is my home. Heaven is my home. America will never save us. It won't. Only Jesus will. And I think that's one of the things that so many people have experienced over this last couple of years is the shock at how quickly things deteriorated, how quickly things became contentious, argumentative, difficult. It's amazing. You know, I am, I'm not much of a beach guy. Uh, I am not much of a beach guy. I am, um, I, I am, I'm very much land bound. Um, I do not like sand. It gets everywhere, into everything. Um, I think of sand very much like I think of glitter. Okay, glitter. Um, do I strike you as a glitter kind of guy? No, uh, because but I, I, I guarantee you, I still have glitter on me from uh, children's ministry projects that happened in the '90s. Because uh, once glitter gets on you, it never goes away. It never goes away. Uh, but if you if you go to the beach, there's a thing called a riptide. Are you familiar with a riptide? Now I stole a picture off of somebody's Facebook. Um, and so uh, that might look familiar to somebody sitting over that way. Um, but here's, here's what a rip current is, a riptide. It's often called a riptide. It's, it's a specific kind of water current that, it, that can occur near beaches with breaking waves. A rip is a strong, localized, narrow current of water which moves directly away from the shore, cutting through the line of the breaking wave like a river running out to sea. A rip current is st the strongest and fastest near the surface of the water. Now, if you, um, if you are not familiar with the rip current, apparently this on the, the yellow circled area, that's what a rip current looks like. 
I don't have a trained eye for what a rip current looks like. Uh, I could not spot a, a rip current uh, if my life depended upon it, and actually it might. It might, because they're strong. How many of you could spot a rip current if you had to? All right, well, apparently we need to study this photo more. But look what it said. It moves away from the shore. But to the untrained eye, we don't know what we're looking for, do we? We don't know what to see. We don't know. We don't, I couldn't stand on the beach and identify that as a rip current. But you can kind of see where it cuts through the, the wave up there, right? Let's take that same idea. And let's call COVID a rip current that went through the church. See, when somebody's leaving the church, there's certain things that I as a pastor have learned. I can identify when somebody's working on leaving a church, typically. First thing they start doing is they, they stop giving. They stop serving. Then they start sitting further and further back in the pew. And so if you're on the last row, I'm not picking on you, because uh, many of you, that's where you're always at, and that's okay. That's all right. The anointing is closer to the front, but that's okay. But I can identify these steps, Right? If somebody changes behavior, this is the thing we talk about. If somebody suddenly stops volunteering in ministry, we want to follow up to make sure everything's okay. If somebody, I know this because the last thing, so the first thing that people do when they're getting ready to start leave a church is they stop giving. You know what the last thing they do when they've decided to stay? They start giving. Money, it says a lot about money to us, doesn't it? But over the years, I've learned to identify what it looks like when somebody's working their way out. But the hard thing was during COVID, it wasn't a sudden gradual drifting out. It was a rip current. COVID accelerated those behaviors for a lot of, because for three months, you couldn't even come physically to the building. And I told you during COVID, we did everything we could to stay in contact with people. We actually had people get mad at us that we called them too much. Stop calling me. Okay, well, you know, we're just trying to let you know we care, but you don't want to know that. See, everyone has their own reason for not doing church like they did before COVID. But I wonder how many people got sucked into that rip current of culture, of change, of the general situation going on, and they never found their way back. To me, the midpoint of the Exodus story helps us to understand this a little bit more. Numbers chapter 13, you can turn there if you like. We're going to open it up. It's a portion of Exodus, the Exodus story. Now, there's the book of Exodus, and then there's the Exodus story. The Exodus story is, Egypt, is Israel leaving, leaving Egypt. But in Numbers chapter 13, we are presented with a very significant portion of this story. Now, I, I read to you already that, that God had promised the descendants of Abram a promised land. How many of you have heard that before, the promised land? And when they left Egypt, that's where they were heading, was to the promised land. And this is about a year after they left Egypt, give or take. Now, we know that just because of the writings and such, but it takes a long time to move 600,000 people through the desert, doesn't it? In Numbers chapter 13, here's, here's what it says, and I'm going to skip a little bit just because it's a bunch of names, but uh, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So the Lord's commanded, so, so at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran, and all of the leaders were of the, of the Israelites. These are their names, and he goes through the names of them. Jumping back down to verse uh, 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and in, out into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are among the strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good? Is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they walled or fortified, unwalled? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some fruit of the land. It was the season for ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob and towards uh, Libo Hamath. They went through the Negev and came back to Hebron where Ahiman and Shehai and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. 
Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eskol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eskol because the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There, they reported to them the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which was set out to us, or you sent us to. It does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruits. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. I'll pause right there in case you're not familiar with that. What they're saying is we saw giants. Descendants of Anak were giants. It's believed that if you, you follow the history of the Philistines, that Goliath was a descendant of Anak. And we know that David declared him as a giant. And we also know that he had brothers who were also giants. The Amalekites lived in Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, Amorites lived in the hill country. And the Canaanites lived near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses said, and we should go and take up possession of land, for we certainly can do it. Caleb silenced them and said, we should go up and take the possession of the land for we certainly can do it. In verse 31, but the men who had gone and said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. They spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devour those who lives in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim. Now again, that's a Old Testament reference to giants. They're the descendants of Enak come from Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Now, where were they standing? They were standing just outside the promised land. Before they were even in captivity. What did God promise Abram? 400 years your people would be enslaved, but they will return here. They'll come back to this land. It is a land that was promised. And, and throughout the New Testament, Old Testament, it describes the boundaries of the promised land. Here's the people of Israel that were miraculously delivered from the clutches of the Egyptians. Think of just all the things that happened. The ten plagues. The firstborn being spared in the Israelites' camp. The Israelites crossing over the Red Sea on dry ground. Not slightly damp, slightly, like, on dry ground. There were miracles. The miracles that we saw before we get to this point, there's at least 10 miracles that are noted in the Exodus story about what the people of Israel had faced and seen before they come to the promised land. An angel of God gave him a pillar of a pillar of a cloud and fire guarded by the multitude, right? A strong wind made path for the Israelites through the Red Sea. The Egyptians' wheels were made to swerve, and then the army was drowned in the, the Red Sea. The bitter waters were made sweet. Manna rained from heaven. Quail was sent to provide meat. Water came from the rock. Moses raised hand, allowed the people of Israelite, the Israelites to prevail over the Amalekites. God spoke from the mountain in Sinai. Miriam's rebellion and then her leprosy was healed. There were miracles. Miracles over and over and over again. This was less than a year or about a year from when the people of Israel were delivered from the Egyptians. The Egyptians considered one of the most advanced societies in the ancient Near East culture. We still marvel at their ability to build pyramids. The people of Israel saw themselves delivered from that, and miracles happen over and over again. But when presented with a new challenge, what happened? Whoa! We can't do that. And they stopped right there. Ten of the 12 spies that went into the promised land, they all agreed, yes, 
It's a land filling with, flowing with milk and honey. It's amazing what God has created in this country. But we can't do it. You know what that I think that's a great example of? It's the rip current of forgetfulness. I have a question for you, and I love what Heather shared because it's something I had considered sharing in the midst of this message. Um, what miracles has God done for you? Does that carry you through hard situations? Or have you forgotten them? Heather shared about the blood disorder that Bennett had, and uh, it could be very disconcerting to have your, I think he was six months old when he tested positive for it, and, and how disconcerting that would be to have your six-month-old child test positive for what could be a lifelong disease. But here's the, what we said to each other. This was our prayer. Because Bennett was really, and still is, um, a miracle to be in our lives. And what we just continue to say is God did not bring this miracle into our life for us to lose it now. We faced hard situations and hard circumstances, discouraging times in that. He had to have surgery. How old was he when he had his first surgery? Maybe a year. God did not bring this miracle into our life for us to lose it. We looked at what God had done before again and again. That's what gave us strength. That's what gave us courage. I'm not saying this as a judgmental kind of thing, but it is so easy to forget when we are pressed in the pressure cooker of life, we are so quick to forget what God has done before in our lives. Unfortunately, so many people have fallen into the uh, role of, or the thought line of, what have you done for me lately? What have you done for me lately? Heather and I were talking about this just the other week. It's, you know, the role of a pastor, the job as a pastor has so many wonderful wonderful things about it. I love being a pastor. I love baptizing people. I love doing communion. I love walking through life with people. I love seeing people develop into who God's called them to be. I love all of that stuff. But I've had friends that were close friends that we had done life with together at church that a simple offense or wrong word cut you off. Why? What have you done for me lately? Not what have you done for me in the past. Not how have you helped me. What have you done for me lately? And I think that happens in the natural world. I think that happens in the spiritual world. I think that happens whether you're a pastor or not. You all have friends. We all have friends that we've experienced that they cut you off as soon as they feel like you have nothing else to offer them. And we forget what a faithful friend they have been. I've got friends that I haven't talked to for several years uh, other than comments here on Facebook, but I can guarantee you, guess what? We're still friends. You've heard me tell stories about Joe's story, and Joe might actually be watching. He, he, he pops in on our Facebook. He lives in uh, South Dakota. I don't talk to Joe a whole lot, but here's what I know. Joe's still my friend. Because the history we've had built that relationship. But the people of Israel, what'd they do? When pressed, facing a difficult situation, they said, wait a minute, we can't do this. We can't do this. It's just a reminder of why we need to do this, why remembering matters. And I have to tell you, remembering really matters matters. Because you're going to have a day that you don't feel like trusting God. You're going to have a day where you're like, why has God blessed that person so much more than me? And I will guarantee you this, comparison to somebody else will always make you feel either better than that person or inferior to that person. Comparison leads to jealousy or pride. 
Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Look at what God has done for you. That's why when Jesus gave us uh, the, the act of communion, the Last Supper, what did he say? He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do you know why? Because Jesus is smarter than us, and he knows that we will forget and take it for granted. And we will start thinking that we are pure, righteous, and holy on our own. That we have delivered ourselves. That we have forgiven our own sins, and that we are mighty on our own. Imagine seeing no fewer than 10 supernatural events in less than a year. And they're not even ones that you go like, well, that, that might have been supernatural. Like the Red Sea parting, manna and quail from heaven that shows up every day. That's not like a questionable event, right? These are things that actually happen. Imagine seeing supernatural events like that, but then coming up to a big problem, you go, no, nah, no, no, that's too much. That's essentially what happened in Numbers chapter 13. And honestly, that's where a lot of Christians found themselves or find themselves in a post-pandemic world. Our thinking has been changed. And the danger of that is that we can start forgetting the faithfulness of God. We can start forgetting all of the good things that he's done in our lives. That's why during the Greg Hubbard services and other times, I have encouraged you, write it down. Did God speak to you? Did God do something for you? Did God say something to you? Write it down down so you don't forget in a post-pandemic world a lot of people we interpret it through anxiety fear worry and doubt it's kicked into high gear inside and outside of the church rather than reflecting on what god has done before and god can do again people have looked at the world through a different lens pastor yvonne and i were talking uh, this week we, we talk in the office regularly we're talking about those that have drifted from church. We pray for them. We continue to reach out to people. But the question that we ask is, do, do they not believe the whole Bible? Don't, for, you know, don't forsake the fellowship of the believer, right? But some people have said, well, it's just so much easier to do it at home. Or they don't engage at all. Listen, there's going to be a day that's what Greg Hubbard, he shared that verse. It's so, such a stark reminder that most, most people, their love will grow cold. And in the final days, they'll stand before Jesus, said, Lord, Lord, didn't I in your name? Didn't I do this in your name? And what's Jesus going to say? Depart from me. I never knew you. John chapter 14, verse 26 says this, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and will remind you or will help you remember everything I have said to you. Remembering the faithfulness of God is what helps us move through the difficult times of today. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 23, what we see is a 40-year wrong turn. Because of the spies that denied what Jesus or what God had done, because of the spies and the people that believed them, and those folks that refused to move into the promise that God had given them, what would have been a year of walking in the desert turned into 40 years of walking in the desert. Now, many of you have probably been driving with a spouse and feel as though they took a wrong turn 40 years ago and they refuse to ask for directions. This is a little different. Because of their lack of faith, their lack of belief, Here's what is said in Numbers 14, 23. Not one of them will ever, the see, will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with, with contempt will see it. An entire generation that was delivered 
from 400 years of slavery died out wandering in the desert because a crisis hit, they panicked, and they forgot the faithfulness of God. Unfortunately, we can do that today, isn't it? We can do that same thing. We can hit a hardship and a difficulty, and we can panic and forgot, forget all that God has done. Now, I want you to understand, caution and panic are different. It's when we wrap ourselves in the report of the world as opposed to believing the report of the Lord that we begin to lose sight of what we've, done, what we've been called to do. And here's what I know. God has a promise for you today. God has been faithful to you time and time again. And when difficulty hurts, when difficulty hits, we cannot panic and live like the world lives. Because what does the world do when crisis hits? They start doing their own research. They start doing this. They look at this, look at that. They, they start, they're going through, let's look at the numbers. Let's see what this is. What do the faithful do when crisis hits? They turn to the cross. And they say, Jesus, I know I'm in your hands. Jesus, I know you have been faithful. Jesus, you have delivered me before, and I know that you will do it again. Jesus, I know you are able. Jesus, I know you are willing. Jesus, I know you are there. And even if my circumstances do not change, my faith will remain strong. Joshua and Caleb were the only two of that generation that made it to the promised land because they were the only two that said, yes, they're giants in the land, but God said to go and possess the land. We have to possess the land that God has promised to us. It's a land of faith. It's the land of his leading. It's the land of his promise. Because when we avoid hard things, because they're hard things, we can be just like the people of Israel and delay the blessing that God has for you. And the story of Israel in the promised land is this. Some of us will miss the blessing of God for our lack of faith. An entire generation missed the blessing of God because they trusted the report of man and not the promise of God. You ever had a promise that God has spoken to you and you shared it with a friend and they go, that's crazy. And you're like, yeah, it is crazy. What am I doing? Why would I think I'd want to do that kind of thing? And you let that dream die. You know, I don't like to use myself as an example a whole lot. Um, but I will tell you this. In every ministry opportunity that Heather and I have taken, and even prior to Heather and I being married, I knew God, I knew God had called me there. I moved to California, 2,700 miles away from uh, home. I didn't know a single person in the state. I met my wife. And if that's the only thing that happened in the eight years that I lived in California, totally worth it. Totally worth it. Was it hard at times being out there by yourself with, you know, millions of other people? Yeah. Heather and I, we answered the call. We moved to Virginia. We didn't know anybody in the state. But it was in that time that we adopted Bennett. And we knew God wanted us there. Now we've been in Jersey for five years. I don't know what other spectacular thing God's going to do, but he's going to do something because God always does. Have times always been easy? No, they haven't. You remember we're talking about COVID? That time really stunk. Like 
The two years of COVID, the, 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 it was awful, rough. But how do we make it through hard times? By remembering the promises of God. By relying on the faithfulness of God. By trusting him. How do we live as a church in the post-pandemic world? I shared it with you last week. But here's the thing that we have to do. We have to lean into the faithfulness of God. Maybe it's been a while since you felt refreshed. Maybe it's been a while since you felt renewed. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus is standing in front of you saying, here I am. I'm the same God that was faithful to you yesterday. And I'm the same God that will be faithful to you tomorrow. You might have to think back a few years, but this is my promise to you. Lean into what Jesus has done for you before. Be Joshua and Caleb and not the other ten. God, you've done it before. You can do it again. You will do it again. So how do we live as a church in a post-pandemic world? I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll summarize Colossians 3. I shared it with you last week. Colossians 3, 1 says, or 3, 2 says this, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Colossians 3, 5, Put to death, whatever, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. 3, 12 says, Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. I shared last week, and we'll throw them up again, seven rules. Live according to Colossians 3.1. Love others. Serve others. Share the gospel. Come to church weekly. Give generously. Be holy. These are just seven rules I came up with. We can come up with so many more. It's not about setting rules. It's not about creating laws. It's not about a legalistic perspective. It's about helping to create guidelines and guides on how to live holy. Because like the people of Israel that were delivered from the Egyptians, after a season of crisis, we need direction. We need guidance. It's not legalism. It's instructions on how to live a life pleasing to God. It's how to be holy. It's how to be holy. Because our thinking got changed. And what I want to encourage you to do as somebody that's been here this week or last week, reach out to somebody that hasn't. Tell them, I miss you at church. Will you come with me? Something just that simple can change the trajectory. Get rid of that stinking thinking that people have fallen into in this season of difficulty and crisis. So the thing I want to encourage you to keep in mind, what's it look like at Calvary Lighthouse? I shared this last week, but I put it, we're going to put it up on the screen this week. We're not spectators. We're participants. We're not receivers only, we are givers. We are not recipients of ministry, we are ministers. We are not strangers in a body, we are the, or in the building, we are the body of Christ and the family of God. If we learn how to live these things out, we get to be part of the guys that go into the promised land because our God is faithful. Our God has more for us. And while it might not feel like it right now in this moment on this day, while it might not feel like it in your circumstances and situations, the reality is God has more for you. And God is faithful. God keeps his promise. The promised land was still the promised land 40 years after Israel wandered in the desert. Why? Because it was the promised land 
of God. And when God makes a promise, that promise is always, 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 always true. Always true. The only time that promise dies is when we walk away from what God has for us. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. Part of being reminded of what it looks like to live in a church family, what it looks like to live in a local church post-pandemic, we talked about the need for our body to support itself. You guys do so good, such a good job in giving. I'm so proud of that. But it's time for some of our folks to step up and serve him. Last week, we talked about our music and media and our children's and youth, and I appreciate that. This week, I wanted to highlight our ushers and our greeters. They're so faithful, but we've lost a bunch over COVID. We need people to help out with our grounds team and maintenance crew. We need people to help out with our, well, our yet to be formed but coming soon parking lot ministry to welcome people as they come in. There's so many things that God wants to do, but they don't want it. God doesn't just want to do it with Pastor Spencer. God wants to use the whole body of Calvary Lighthouse to minister. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray. I want to invite you. Would you consider serving? Children's ministry, youth ministry, music, media, those are great. We'd love to have you. But out of the big blue wall, we've got to sign up for ushers and greeters, parking lot, building and maintenance, grounds. It's a real simple thing. You say, well, Pastor Spencer, how does this tie to your message? Well, part of this is being in a family. Part of this is being God's people. We're a family. We're a body of believers. And part of seeing God's promises fulfilled in our community is all of us coming together to build his church, to invest in his house, and to show people this is what it looks like to live a loving life with others. And so in just a moment, I'm going to pray. I want to invite my friends from the prayer team to come down, those that are here today. Maybe you're looking for that promise of God you need some encouragement. Maybe you're looking really far into that. I'm going to pray. When I say amen, I invite you to do a couple of things. If you need prayer today for that promise, come down and let one of my friends from the prayer team pray with you. If you feel God stirring in your heart, yeah, it's my opportunity to jump in. Go to the big blue wall and sign up. But the other thing I want to invite everybody to do, pray for the body of Calvary Lighthouse. Pray for those that have called it home before that perhaps they're wandering in the wilderness and they just need to come back home. You might be the difference between them taking a 40-year wrong turn and it just being a short season in their life. You have more influence than you know. You can have a greater impact than you ever realize just by showing people love. And so this morning, I'm going to pray. I normally close with a prayer of blessing. We'll do that all together. But when I say amen, if you need prayer, please come down. You want to sign up at the big blue wall. There's sign-up sheets out there. But recognize we are one body. We're in this together. And I want to believe the report of the Lord that says we can possess the land. You stand with me. Father, this morning, I pray for the restoration of your promise in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits. Father, I pray this morning that we would be like Joshua and Caleb. That we wouldn't wander for years wondering, what if? What if we had only leaned into 
that promise? What if we had only tried to possess the land? What if we had believed in faith that what you said was true? Let us be Joshua and Caleb that said, yeah, it looks big, it looks scary, it looks hard, but my God is faithful. Father, I pray you bless your people. Your Bible promises us, your word promises us that old men will dream dreams and young men will see vision. Give us dreams and vision that can only come from you. Holy Spirit, speak. Holy Spirit, speak. Even as I'm praying right now, I, I, I really feel the Holy Spirit stirring something inside of some people. You're being reminded of what God has called you to, of who God has called you to be, of what God has done faithfully in your life. It's time to run towards it, not away from it. Run to that call and see what God does with it. Jesus, this morning I pray for each person that's here. New dreams, new visions, new hopes, new desires, all inside of your heart and in your love for us. Jesus, Jesus, birth new things inside of us. Father, I pray you bless your people today. Bless them with your vision and your desire. Bless them with your faithfulness and your presence. Bless them with the promised land of your call in their life. Let them see the reality of who you are and what you've done. Bless us all. In your precious name we pray. Amen.